I talk a lot about digitalization and the future strategies and, and, and future-proof business. And today I decided to tell you a love story. It's a personal love story, and as every love story, it um, starts with infatuation, goes through a stormy, cold, troubled period, and then ends up with a kind of a long-term, comfortable relationship with well-understood roles. This love story has two parties. I'm one of them. The other party is not my dear husband. <laughs> it's actually not a he, it's not a she, it's an it, IT. Uh, it's uh, kind of my lifelong relationship with deep and broad uses of information technology. It's becoming a part of not only our societies, but also of who we are. It's changing our humanity. And I think it's incredibly important to share some of the kind of ups and downs of this relationship, because I think the sto this particular love story will repeat it itself with most of you in the very few months to come. It's relevant internationally and locally and individually. I'll say a few, few words about my life, because uh, who we are affects, of course, all of our relationships. So the kind of three major parts to my personal and professional life, the first one is this age of IT infatuation. About 25 years ago, I went to Oxford, did a PhD in algorithm design. This is a borderline subject between mathematics and computing or programming. And I used some of this uh, work to later have a small part in the development of one of the first search engines called Alta Vista. This was 99, a very interesting time in Silicon Valley, because this was just after the internet came to stay. We realized it's going to be very big, but we didn't still know where the money is going to come from. I remember sitting and eating lunch with some of the people working with another search engine that was still a very early startup at the time. They laughed at us because our owners, DEC, Digital Equipment Corporation, didn't want to put commercial money into commercial growth of this search engine. We laughed back because they tried selling themselves to DEC twice for $1 million and had received a negative answer twice. And now, today, they are one of the most valuable companies in the world. I'm talking about Google. If you look at the five most valuable companies in the world, they are all coming from software. And there is something to their business model that's making them immensely powerful. Already 25 years ago, when we were developing this technology, we could see the future potential of it. And we were so fascinated. This is going to change the world. This is going to be the engine of growth, something that will bring this incredible abundance in every product and every service that we have. We also believed it's going to be very democratizing because everybody's going to have access. So finally, we will eliminate things like hunger, power shortages, democratic shortages, and it'll be great. Trust us, it'll be great. Then my wonderful Norwegian husband and I decided to come back to Norway because this is a place where you can actually more easily combine some other parts of your life than your work back into your life. And eventually we had four children. And this motherhood changed my perspective. I looked at these four messy little beings by now five, seven, nine, and 11, and reveled in their messiness, made me aware of the beauty, the glorious messy beauty of the human condition. I didn't want them to be any more optimized than they were. Wanted them just as stubborn and, 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 and hopeless. Couldn't be better objective as every mother, of course. But it kind of made me aware of this human condition problem. Maybe we really shouldn't be optimized to live as many years as possible. Maybe we shouldn't be optimized in terms of how we behave with other people, what we eat, when we train. Maybe we should just be who we are and make the most of that. Maybe that's why we are here. So I actually started hating AI. 
I, th I thought, you know, I really don't want it to make the world this mesh where everything is normalized into something that will just last as long as possible and make as much profit as possible. And then the third phase is I'm not just a mother, I'm a board director, and I realize I can't help build these companies for the future unless I actually use the power of technology. It has to be a part of the equation. So what do we do? Maybe I should say just two words about myself as well. I'm pathologically curious, and I'm hopelessly, hopelessly stubborn and independent. I can't even stick to a script. I'm sorry, my dear coaches. So. You know, I think we are here also to ask questions, and we have to ask our unique questions. I'm also a long-term optimist, but a short-term pessimist. I think that's um, a useful strategy, given some of the countries I've lived in and that have gone not so well. The other party, AI, maybe deserves a few words as well. So it has become infinitely smart, smarter in the 20 years that we've been friends. We started with something that was purely science fiction, purely mathematical logics, and now it has become a part of our everyday life. Science fiction has become science reality. Cars are driving themselves, we have robot surgeons, we have robot journalists, we have robot everything. And not only our things, but also our society, our banks, our energy infrastructure, our media picture, our politics are becoming driven by this digital infrastructure and this AI. It's super smart, it's super rational, and it poses two very important questions. If it is so much more efficient than humans, will it replace us? What's our role in the future business and the future society? And the second thing, if it really can optimize us so much, if it really can help us think better, live longer, you know, how, how should it do that? Along which values? Three quick examples. One is a car. Imagine a car driving on its own along a road, navigates really well through its sensors, it's reading the road, it's reading the traffic, it's reading the weather and the other components of this complex picture. Suddenly a child jumps in front of the car. Should the car hit the child? or should it swerve into a truck beside you and kill you? If it's a 30% probability that the child will die or a 60% probability that you will die, what should it do, the algorithm in the heart of the car, if the probabilities are opposite? What should it do if you have bought a platinum version of Tesla that gives you a slightly better chance? What should it do if every insurance company in the world actually owns 10% of Tesla, or if you have a special insurance plan with them? These are very deep value-based questions. And this is exactly the problem with AI. It's trying to optimize the world when the world is a hopelessly complex system. Every day, our world and our lives are met with a number of impossible choices. It's not that one or the other are absolutely better than each other. It's just that you have to choose. And it's how we make these impossible choices that defines us as humans. This is what we humans know or learn. This is what it's impossible to program an AI to do in a locally, individually correct way if we think global optimi. Every war in human history was based on disagreement on what's best given to impossibly like choices. Another example is a robot journalist, for example. It's writing really well, colloquially funny. You can't really guess it's a robot, except it's perfectly optimized for you. And it's serving you exactly the news it knows you want. But the human journalist might have given you the news you need. Because as my mother told me many, many times in my life, what you want is not necessarily what you need. Where is the element of surprise? The last point is teacher. Think about the first lecture you heard today about the role of seeing the human on the other side in order to be able to affect them. An AI teacher will provide you with an optimal curriculum for exactly your needs and your personality. But you can't give it an apple. You can't give, get a human reaction 
on you being a human. How are you going to care about what that AI teacher actually thinks about you, which is the best motivating factor for learning? I think these examples remind us about the human superpower. Actually, two of them. One is to learn in order to change our minds. And the other thing is the power to choose when you have impossible choices. I think that in the future where we get so incredibly good AI-enabled, digitally-driven tools for our health, for our learning, for our driving, for our everything, financial and other kinds of social lives, the important role for humans will be not to not use these tools, because none of us will afford to do that. It will be to ask the right questions and interpret the ambiguous answers that any kind of a logical system will give you when you get such a complex set of conditions like this world gives you. So we have to be the driver in the driverless society. We have to demand to take that will, and we have to define our goal, and then we have to have the courage, perhaps, to take the road less traveled. Not the optimal road, but the one that we individually want to take. The other question is, this is the role, collaboration with the tools. The other question was, how should we accept this optimization? Isn't, isn't my humanity task, individually, to try to make the most out of this hopelessly messy chemistry that I was given at, the, at birth? As a mother of four, I know that we think we can shape our children, but really, they are really quite done when they come out. <laughs> and your human condition is living your life, you know, with this set of enzymes that you're made out of, your reaction patterns, and making the most out of that for you, your local con context, and maybe the world as the whole. So, but if they do everything so much better than we do, these machines, I mean, they have so much data, they have so much computing power, and they can read each other's minds through the cloud. We have had this thing called Moore's Law. We have had exponential growth in data, in computing power, and in network connectivity. How can we possibly compute, compete? <laughs> I was really worried about this question. And, and, you know, it's because I thought we were logical, rational machines. And then I was sitting with my kids one day, and you know, they asked a million questions. And no AI could come up with questions like that, I guarantee you. And one of them wanted to know, it was Thomas, of course, was Nikola Tesla smarter than Albert Einstein? And I was like, how am I to know? No, but what do you think? Let's Google it. No, 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 what do you think, mommy? I, I really don't know. And then, then we started talking, and we were thinking, well, you know, Einstein, and I need to get this right because of Christoph, I know. <laughs> What did Einstein do? Um, he was thinking about, you know, riding a ray of light, and then somehow he figured out this special theory of relativity, E equals mc squared, etc. What did Tesla do? Well, he was, he was thinking about generators. He had this incredible visual imagination, and he could think about the whole new world of generators, and then suddenly he figured out alternating current. Let's throw Newton in the mix. He was thinking about a world without friction a complete impossibility, and figured out our motion laws. No AI in the world could come up with so impossible thought experiments. It takes an irreverent, stubborn human to come up with something so far out. AIs are very, very smart, but they are disciplined. Our rebelliousness is our human superpower. We can think about things that are not, maybe things that shouldn't be, in order to figure out things that really should be. And this is a big difference in computation, because we can figure out long-term optimi. The way that AIs work and learn is figuring out so-called local optimi. So I think we will use these amazing tools, but I think we will be thinking the impossible questions and then using the tools to prove our incredibly brilliant answers. What I would like to leave you with is that there is an absolutely necessary role for us in the future. The future is up to us. The role is 
to take the wheel in this autonomous society of future, insist on asking the right questions, insist on being able to interpret the answers in an individual and local way, and enjoying the ride. The future is up to us, it's up to my messy kids, and I think it's really cool. Thank you.